All right, YouTube folks, feel free to skip ahead about a minute. Uh, I just started up the stream, and I'm going to give people a second to jump in before I get started with my content. Hey, Basic Planes, welcome. Good evening, Hondo. Uh, basic Planes, when do you want your Brightlings back? I can give them to you at the end of tonight's stream. I can give them to you tomorrow after potentially a stream. Um, what's what's your timeline for that? I'm happy to return them to you whenever you need them back. Okay, cool. So I'm gonna let some people join before I start playing games, but I wanna, I wanna talk about rewards, right? Like we we had a thousand uh, what I found followers on the stream, and and that's pretty big for me. So as as a reward, I'm gonna do two Nick Fit streams. I have approximate deck lists for what I'm thinking about playing. All right, number one. Oh, uh, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to condense this. This is in so many rows. Get this all on screen here. No. How's this? Okay, that'll work. Alright, so I said I'd do two Nick Fit lists, and people were pretty excited about Arena Rector. For so for anyone who doesn't know this, when it dies. It, okay, basically it's Academy Rector, but you get a Planeswalker, right? So when, a when Arena Rector dies, you may exile it. If you do, search your library for a Planeswalker card, put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle your library. So Arena Rector can get you something like super big and stupid. And the one of choice here was Ugin the Spirit Dragon. So in this deck, uh, Arena Rector can get you Elspeth Sun's Champion to just create a whole bunch of blockers or wipe the board. Ugin the Spirit Dragon to, like, do Ugin things. A Gideon of the Trials for, against something like Storm, you just, like, can't lose. Or a Lily Last Hope to start going chipping away at things. So you have four different silver bullet targets for Arena Rector. And then you have a bunch of the usual Nick Fit stuff. Oh, what's up with this Veteran Explorer? I don't know how I feel about that. I like the old picture a lot. But this does look like an Explorer. Oh no, we're we're playing Brightling Dot Deck. I'm just I'm just showing off deck lists that I'm thinking about playing for the bonus Nick Fit streams. Uh, deck list number two that I'm thinking about playing is even spicier. Let's look at this monster. So deck list number two is like. John Nick Fit featuring Sneak Attack. And this seems like it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, someone says Brightling has been a disappointment. Well, I hope to prove you wrong tonight. Uh, so this list looks really fun because, like, you can Veteran Explorer out a Sneak Attack and then sneak big idiots, or you can just, like, Veteran Explorer out the big idiots themselves. Um, so it has all the usual stuff. But you have a bit more interaction because, like, you have these these punishing fires along with Grove of the Burn Willows for like some resiliency. So you're just gonna like tear apart small stuff and then hope to grind through the game with like Eternal Witness, Woodland Bellower, Recurring Nightmare, Marin, Grave Titan, Inferno Titan, and it just seems like it's gonna be a whole lot of fun. Just ignore that calling in the command in the sideboard. Focus on the slaughter games. Focus on the slaughter games and everything will be okay. Okay, so TG Honda, what makes a Nick Fit de a deck a Nick, Nick Fit deck? So Nick Fit, generally speaking, refers to the package of Cabal Therapy and Veteran Explorer as your build around card. So when Veteran Explorer dies, each player can search their library for up to two basic lands and put them onto the battlefield. So what Nick Fit is trying to do is abuse Veteran Explorer to ramp out large threats that go over the top of your opponent. That's Nick Fit's general strategy. 
The Cabal Therapy in Veteran Explorer is the most important part, although Pernicious Deed is the other big build around card. Other than that, there's a lot of room for experimentation in the shell. Green Sun Zenith is one of the cards that staples everything together, because it's just four more copies of Veteran Explorer, while also being your big bomby things once you have all of your lands. Uh, so Red Panda, I got both of these deck lists from the NickFit Discord, and I chatted with, uh, with everyone there uh, a little bit this afternoon, and they were, they were very helpful in kind of like helping me select deck list. Uh, talk to this guy. Uh, I'm not entirely sure I'm in love with the sideboard. It feels like I really need like one more surgical or one more piece of hand disruption, but I like a lot of what's, what's going on here in this deck list. Yeah, no problem. Alright, so let's talk about today's stuff. Good evening everyone, my name's Phil Gallagher, I run Thraben University, and today we're going to be streaming with Mono White DNT featuring Brightling. Uh, we have two new cards in the deck list. We have Remorseful Cleric, which is a 2-1 flyer for 2 mana, that has Tormod's Crypt on it. That is, you can sacrifice it to exile all cards from target player's graveyard. I've been getting paired against Dredge quite a bit, uh, so this has been a, a very good main deck card. It's stolen a lot of games for me. Uh, otherwise, just being a 2-1 flyer for 2 mana is not bad, right? Like, I played Celta Spirit quite a bit to just kind of, like, try that out to fill the curve a little bit, since we're effectively light on 2 drops. Uh, so this has been pretty good, and Brightling's been an all-star. I'm very, very sold on Brightling. Uh, that's why I moved up to the 3rd in the sideboard, even though I had 2 in my original lists. Um, Brightling does a lot of really cool things, some of which I didn't consider. Uh, one that came up last stream that I hadn't thought of is that you can shrink Brightling three times in order to kill Bridge from Below's when you're facing Dredge. Uh, that didn't actually happen, but it was something that someone in the chat brought up as, like, a possibility. Oh, oh, oh. Ramen Lover, thank you. I think I switched the planes. Yeah. We're safe. Playing two leagues with the bad planes was, was terrible. That's why we only went 3-2. Um, I am a big believer in the lightning planes. Uh, I just really like the art. Uh, this is what I use on paper as well. Yeah, attacking through and snaring bridge is awesome. It's so much fun. Korean Revised. Okay, I can respect that choice. I really like foreign magic cards. Uh, most of my hate bears in D&T are foreign. Uh, it's going well, Army of Helia. Uh, it's just been very busy. Uh, we've had a hectic couple of days at Latin Academy. I mean, it's always hectic, but more, more so than normal. We had a couple of students who had to run to urgent care for various silly things. Nothing actually too serious, but, like, we, we had a kid get the flu, uh, and we, we had to send him home, and it was kind of unfortunate. That sort of thing. How rude would it be to run for in Brightlings? Ooh. Do they have four in Brightlings? because I might need them. Wait. Oh no. Oh no, this is... I was still registered from the previous league. I don't have to look at these planes for four more matches. Ugh. Still. All right, well, we're gonna play the snow-covered planes first. It looks prettier than the other planes. Uh, I think historically my opponent plays some sort of like cloud post deck. Mm. That grim monolith around the the good old Rashadon port here is gonna do less work. <sighs> okay, what is what does this mean for me? Do I just want to port down that ancient tomb? What is my game plan? If I don't, they have three, four, five, they have six mana. 
potentially like seven or eight mana so they can cast something big and stupid. I'd love a revoker to shut off that monolith because then I can just keep making land drops forever while porting. If you owe three, you can change your basic land sooner. <laughs> I'm just going to pour. My opponent will get one use out of the Grim Monolith, and that's fine. Let's see how bad this is. Pretty bad. Now I'm past the point where I can reasonably be on the mana denial plan for right now. Alright, so my opponent will have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Alright, my opponent has infinite mana, basically. So what am I doing? Probably just a spot where I slam a Brightling and try to just clock my opponent out over the course of a few turns. I don't expect it to work. I expect some something annoying like Ubian or a Giant Eldrazi to come down, and I won't be able to answer it in order to lose game one. Well, the problem is that the big scary might just be a Planeswalker. Actually, I am not all that into um, history. I am much more of a mythology person. Uh, that's that's my jam. I'm very much into like the the cultural side, um, but I don't particularly find the history quite as engaging. It's just a personal preference. So I can chump block this Olamog, then I would just die to it on the next attack anyway. And this card's also pretty hard to beat. So rather than reveal another 20 cards in my library, I'm just going to concede here. Ooh, that's a tricky one. What's my favorite Greek myth? Let me think about that, and then I'll answer. Game one loss to big Olamog. So what do I want? Relic order. Get in here. Recruiter, you're probably pretty good. Council's judgment, probably pretty good. Prelate, 
questionable, but not without merit. These are the cards that might end up coming in. Actually, Path might be better than Swords to Plowshares as well. So that's probably a pretty easy swap. All right, uh, this isn't really a Jitte matchup. That can go. This isn't a Mother of Rune matchup. That does basically nothing. I guess I can like question how many swords of vouchers I actually want to run. So they're 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 good against some portions of the deck and dead against others. Yeah, so like the seven crosses or sorry, um Alan, the, the problem with that is that like there's probably like one Ugin in the deck, right? Maybe like two all is dust, so like what are you even naming with this prelate? Might bring in the other Brightling as well. It's very good against the Eldrazi side of the deck. That they're just trying to ag you out with big things, and this is a card that can't just be pinged, which is nice. Good enough. Oh, nice guy, welcome. Glad to be a part of your evening. Uh, this is my only evening stream of Latin Academy. This is this is my one night off. Um, you know, there, there are nine staff members, 45 kids, so in order to keep a good, like, teacher-to-kid ratio, we really need everyone around most of the time. Especially since sometimes people have to run off doing various things, getting mail, moving supplies around. So it's really an all-hands-on-deck job for most of the day. So I I went and I got myself sushi, and then I decided I was going to mess around with the love of my life, Brightling, for a little while. Uh, so this will be an interesting choice to see whether or not my opponent wants to name my Aether Vial or my Wasteland. Uh, so Ramen Lover Ninja, I can see cutting Thalia. But the, the issue is that they have a bunch of mana rocks, right? And those mana rocks are, like, very important to their game plan. Do I just want to nug this with Wasteland? Kind of do. But if I just top deck a Plains, I can Sorcerer Spyglass that away. But I really don't want my opponent to go like another Soul Land Thrand Dynamo right now. So I will I will take a risk here. My opponent took a mulligan, so they might not actually have all that much mana. Uh, the kids did not do the marketplace thing yet, that'll be tomorrow. Perfecto. I'm going to run this out here as a threat. Uh, do I want to name like Grim Monolith, Thran Dynamo, or Ugin? I'm pretty far away from an Ugin. I can deal with that if need be with this, or Recruiter for another Revoker. So I should probably just name a Mana Rock. My opponent realistically hasn't had a chance to play a Grim Monolith yet. So I'm just going to name Thran Dynamo, I think. Thran's a 2 out of 3 of, Grim Monolith is a 4 of, 
Yeah, but I think I'm more afraid of the Thran Dynamo, right? But I guess the Thran Dynamo is a couple turns away since that's just a cloud post on a naked board. So maybe for that reason, Grim Monolith is better. So the reason why I'm getting rid of that is just so that I can put an immense amount of pressure on my opponent over the next few turns. Where are all my Brightwing haters at? I know you're there. Do I just want to nug my opponent for five, or do I want to like tutor for a Thalia or a Revoker? Just taking my opponent off the cloud post is probably good enough, so I think I'll just nug my opponent for five, and then Recruiter of the Guard, end of turn for a Flicker Wisp. You too, Army of Thalia. Have fun. Oh man, look at those haters. Look at them. They're hating so hard. Uh, yeah, I'm actually playing Remorseful Cleric. Uh, it's been pretty good. I'm quite happy with it. Alright, so I can hit for 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. I can hit for 8 right now. I think rather than doing that, I just want to, like, attack for 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Attack for 7, then Flicker Wisp Recruiter, getting another... Flicker Wisp to Flicker Wisp out a Cloud Post. My clock's not going to change either way, so this is just more value, but maybe maybe I should play in a way that doesn't get like punished by Warping Whale. Because like, if I try to Warping Whale this Recruiter, they can just like Warping Whale that. I guess that really doesn't matter. I don't really feel like they have that card. I mean, if I was going to flicker something, I'd just flicker it at my end step, right? Okay, what, what plays around in all is dust. That's a card that I care about. I can I crack for 5, 6, 7, 8, leave 1 up to bounce Brightling. Yeah, let's do that. And then still do all the other stuff that I was talking about.
I mean, I feel like they're not gonna Ugin this turn. Call, call it a hunch. Denying, denying two mana is pretty sweet. Brightling, gas, ladies and gentlemen. Well, so so, if I if I flickered the recruiter, I would have I would have spent three mana, flickered recruiter, gotten another flicker wisp, and then have the same board. But my opponent would be at two more life, and I wouldn't be able to bounce the brightling if they did something like an all is dust randomly somehow. Maybe Stoneforge Mystic is a little slow in this matchup, and I should just like play another Brightling just as a, an aggressive card to play out. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I don't know that I can see myself ever playing a full playset of Brightling. It's not great in multiples. but I probably want a third for the collection. Oh man, what's this? Second monolith. Turn one Thran Dynamo. And more? And a ratchet bomb. Okay. Well, Chad, a lot of things happened there. Now what does this mean for your good old Uncle Phil? I have two choices. Choice one is play out Aether Vial and hope my opponent does not have fat in their hand. If I just play out Ether Vial, it'll just get like blown up by the Ratchet Bomb immediately. And I just trade resources there. But then my opponent can use Thran Dynamo to untap a Monolith. Choice two is pray that my opponent does not have a land and try to just keep them on three mana instead of five mana. Um, both lines kind of suck. Because if my opponent has a land, which is like one of the most likely things they are to have, it's super punished for doing this wasteland. I really want to draw a Phyrexian Revoker. Ugh. That's an amazing turn one. I'm going to take the Wasteland play because it has a very high upside if it works. It did not work. But it could have worked. All right, hoping, hoping for no fat. Mm -hmm. 
It's a lot of mana. Oh no. That that officially qualifies as bad. If I draw your Revoker or a Recruiter, I can, well, not, I would really like to draw Revoker exactly right now, or Council's Judgment. Otherwise, that Ugin ultimates, and I probably can't win. Alright, come on, four outer. Hmm. Hmm. Well, the good news is, I have a reset button. Bad news is, my opponent still has an Ugin. Flickerwisp does not have flash. Flickerwisp is a regular old creature. Ugh. Thugan is just gonna like lightning bolt me to death. Got a slightly better plan, Seven Crosses. Uh, Nerf Blaster, thank you very much for your support. I think in order to stay in this game, I need to keep my life total high-ish. So I think, like, gaining the 5 life here is pretty important. So many monoliths. Okay, okay. Everything's fine. Ish. Uh, this Oblivion Sower, I can just beat with, like, Brightling. Like, Brightling, just getting the lifelink back will, will crack back harder than that. I'm gonna think for a moment, because I might actually be able to do just better. So what if I just, like, play Brightling this turn? My end step, Flicker Wisp out the Ugin. 
then I won't die if my opponent has something stupid like a Warping Whale to remove my Revoker. And then the next turn, I can Violin Recruiter, get Revoker. What's the starting loyalty on this bad boy? Starting loyalty is 7. So if I do Brightling plus Flicker Wisp, I do have the possibility of just killing the... Yeah, yep, yep, okay, this is just better. Yeah, yeah, whatever. If they draw an Olivog, like, I'm not beating that no matter what, right? What comes after the Olive's Dust? Ah, Worm Coil Engine and Olive's Dust and Ugin. Okay. Alright. That's gonna be hard to wiggle out of. So I can cast a Thalia, put in a recruiter, cast a revoker, revoke the Ugin. Use a Thalia to chump block a worm coil engine, take five, go to one, maybe go somewhere from there. Probably not, but maybe. Like I have bouncing Thalia shenanigans in the not too distant future. And then I can try to stabilize with the Brightling. So, I think I'm fine with throwing away this Thalia. Since I have another Thalia. I'm considering just, like, chumping both here, keep my life total at 6, crack them down to 9, play Thalia, chump Worm Coil with Thalia, bounce it, take 5 next turn, go to 1, put in Brightling, gain 5 on the crack back, continue bouncing Thalia. I think that's all fine. Oh no, I don't have more things. Okay, that's fine. Alright. And we're ignoring the Zugan. We're not going to like kill both the Ugin and my opponent. That's just not reasonable. Uh, Lord Darkview, I'll let you think about that.
I'm really happy that I'm not just like dead yet. This is cool. Alright, well, as long as we're on the same page. Stop having things. I can't, I can't deal with more things. Okay, that's slightly annoying as it eliminates some of my outs, but not the end of the world. Okay. This is not bad. Once I'm on six mana, this is actively very good. Because I can cast it and like Brightling Bounce in a turn. So this turn. Yeah, I agree. It should have been X equals two to stop the Thalia shenanigans. So I cast Thalia, leave up one for Caracas. So I need to I need to block both of these. So I'll go block worm coil bounce. I'll go block with Brightling. Bounce. So it's just an attack with Revoker. No, I need I need one more white mana to do everything that I want to do. XJ Cloud, I live on the razor's edge. God, Brightling's so good. It's enabling me to do some like really silly things right now. I just I just need more mana. Like once I get another mana, I'm in such good shape. Well, well all right, maybe not good shape. That might be an exaggeration, but
Mana. Mana confirmed. Yeah, chat, you do realize I have like four minutes on the clock, right? I can't think through this carefully. This game's going to go like very, very, very long. Oh, that's annoying. So, what happens if I tap out for this Batter Skull? I leave myself with one white mana up. Batter Skull can chump block a Worm Coil. So, if I play Batter Skull, it chump blocks a Worm Coil. I throw away a Thalia. And then bounce Brightling. And then I put this Batter Skull on. Uh, that's bad. Alright, so I need to get this in play, that's for sure. And then I'll figure out what exactly I'm doing after that uh, on my opponent's turn. Uh, to blow the stream. So, this is like super unfortunate. I need, I need this Thalia to get the Batter Skull equipped, and then I can beat the Worm Coils. So I might actually be... Oh, shit. Shit, shit, shit. That Thespian stage gets a copy Caracas. Oh, that's... I'm mega boned. How do I beat that now? Hope they don't see it is correct. That is my plan. Okay, no, no attack is good for me. Hmm. Uh, God. All right. So. Pretty boned. All right, what if I put Batter Skull on Brightling? No, then my opponent just attacks in with both Warm Coil engines. Shit. So I can... So 
So if I move the batter skull to Thalia, I attack in, my opponent blocks his oblivion sower, I gain six, I go up to seven life. Then my opponent bounces the Thalia, then I can move Batter Skull to Brightling. Yeah, this is a this is a hell of a weird game. Alright, so what can I do? So... I can't block with Revoker and leave the other... yeah. Uh, I think this is the point where I just die. Yeah. So, like, we're so close. So, so close. Uh, so... Ugin. That's that's the game changer here. If if I chump block with the revoker, Ugin kills me. Yeah, see, like, that's that's the thing that changes it all. So, like, there's, there's a lot of things I could have done differently, but clock, right? So for like anyone wondering why I'm so hot on Brightling right now, Brightling almost beat two six six lifelink death touchers and an oblivion seller. Like that's so far beyond what Crusader and Avenger were doing as the generic beaters of choice. It's like such an insane degree of, of flexibility. Ugh. All right, back in we go.
Azure Reflection, thank you very much for subscribing. I, I appreciate your support. I hope you're enjoying this content. I'm having a blast playing it. <laughs> My opponent says, oh, hey, it's the Brightling mirror. says, full disclosure, I may have had too many beers while watching France versus Belgium. Um, my opponent plays Stoneforge decks. Uh, gen generically speaking, Stoneforge decks. See if my opponent has the stone forge as well. Or sorry, the batter skull as well. They do. So I'll be putting in Jitte at my opponent's end step. I'll then be giving a Stoneforge Mystic Pro White. Once that resolves, I'll Swords to Plowshares to Batter Skull Germ, and then send Stoneforge Mystic in with the Jitte. <laughs> Belchmaster, I I've been asking for a rest in peace bear for Christmas, and I got pretty close. Uh, Remorseful Cleric isn't exactly what I wanted, but it's good enough. Yeah, sure. I'll take that hit.
Um, do I want to let that happen? I can just swords that, prevent them from getting this sort of fire and ice. But if I do that, in order to get my Jitte counters, I'd need to give protection from both white and black next turn. And, I need, and I'd be in trouble if my opponent has a Swords to Plowshares. They didn't have a Swords to Plowshares for my initial, initial Mother of Runes, though. Hmm. If I just let that happen, I source to plowshares, batter skull, give pro white, equip, bash in, have two jetty counters. I think I let this happen. I mean, Brightling is a fine name. I don't think it needs to be shortened. B money. That's a, it's an interesting response. All right, so I won game one. So game one win with Jete. Yes, Brightling is is biking. The card the card's great. Alright, so let's figure out what's bad and then we'll figure out what's good. Thalia, bad. Probably don't want those in the deck. Um, probably won't play the paths. It's something I can board in, but something I probably don't need to board in. Um, I didn't necessarily need to mom. I wanted to do so. I'd, I'd path that, like, uh, a Source of Plowshares type card in, in mind. I didn't want to, like, run into a situation where it was, like, block with Flicker with, I give protection, Source of Plowshares in response, I have to use second mom. I just wanted to preempt that. Okay, so I have six cards I want to bring in. I don't necessarily have to bring in the other Brightling, but it's really good.
don't really know how to sideboard now. Like, the clerics are flyers in the early game, and that matters a lot. Is it the random crusader? I don't know. Are you more afraid to see Dread of Night or Incredible Massacre? Dread of Night. Dread of Night hits really hard. Like, Massacre hits hard once, but Dread of Night hits hard all game. Well, both games I've started on a turn one play, and my opponent hasn't had a turn one play, so that's, uh... Very obviously favoring me here. <laughs> I see. Just a series of epithets to show off our love of Brightling. That's totally understandable. First of his name. I need a little gas. My anthem is not really doing a lot. Sort of War and Peace. That qualifies as bad news bears. That attack's pretty free, I can't really afford to block. So I don't actually think I want to wasteland my opponent. I kind of want to let them put Sword of War in peace, go for equip. I sword the plowshares to stone forge that they equip it to. Then I counsel's judgment away the sword. But I have to play the the Rashadon port over the the wasteland there to really make that work. I mean, Texas, I'm also playing War and Peace, so, you know, take that for what you will. Uh, 
and Phyrexian Revoker. Okay. That resolves. I'd love to draw another white source. Man, Reiki's so good in the mirror. Mm, I kind of want to sort this Revoker to just, like, really alleviate the pressure that's on my mana because I can't use it in my next turn cycle anyway unless I top deck a white source and just unlocking this Aether Vial can be pretty nuts this is an aggressive line God, so, so incredibly rewarded for that. My opponent says, okay, now I'm curious. So I'm going to leave up this Wasteland so that my opponent can't Wasteland my Wasteland. Hmm. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Let the games begin. I'm gonna take that point of damage. I don't wanna give them information that might inform like a Phyrexian Revoker in second main phase or something. So now my Rashad and Port will get wastelanded. Yep. Beautiful. Would be a savage, savage, savage source of plowshares, but I don't think that's happening.
lot of wastelands. Does my opponent have batter skull from earlier this game? No. And if I attack him, my opponent has batter skull. It's like so bad. It's like game losing bad. Or is it? Because if they have Batter Skull, I just move my sword to my Stone Forge. And then the next turn, I put in Batter Skull and move the sword to that. Actually, if I, if I attack in this turn, this turn I just put in Batter Skull and then equip Sword of War and Beast to that. So the attack is probably fine. The, the Jitte actually doesn't do much on the current board. So I'll go in. Rewarded. And notice how I didn't play my land pre-combat. Hey Datza, thank you very much for subscribing. I appreciate your support and I'm happy that you get to see me live. Opponent votes for Batter Skull. I too will vote for Batter Skull. I would consider us as winning. The scoreboard doesn't reflect that, but um the deck is doing super cool things.
Okay, so my opponent has one card in hand. I can either hit them for... I can hit them for two, I can hit them for three this turn, or I can hit them for five this turn. <coughs> If I hit them for five this turn, so I move the sword to Revoker. I hit them for five. That puts them to four. I remove the I move the sword back to the Stoneforge Mystic, so that they can't connect with Brightling, and then I have Lethal the following turn. That throws away my Germ Token. Does that matter? If I just hit them for three, that puts them to six, and I do not have lethal next turn if they play a card. So I believe it is correct to move my Jete twice this turn. Uh, and I will tap both of these first in order to do that. So that Wasteland doesn't, like, break me up somehow. So, just because it's on the other side of the table now, imagine how good this would have been if I didn't have the Sword of War and Peace around. I'd have gotten obliterated. Okay. I would have done that in... Ah, no, it's fine to do it here. Now what? Can hit my opponent for three, put them to one. But I should probably just hold back. Use the swords to plowshares on. Uh, presumably a Stoneforge Mystic. I can't, I can't really reasonably attack. Or can I? So I can put them to one if I attack. No, I can't, I can't attack. No, damage is based on cards in their hand, and they went Hellbent. All right, this this game's gonna go on for a few more turns. I'm close to the finish line, but I'm not quite there.
Actually, there is just a world where I ignore life totals and just like block this Stoneforge Mystic this turn and let them crack for a bit with the Brightling. Like let them gain the life back and just like try to fight to the board. And try to like put them in a position where they tap out for the Brightling. Like don't hold up a white mana. Then I can like use the Swords of Plowshares on the Brightling. Kind of like that. Because this means I don't have to use this source to plowshares, and my opponent can, like, levelize the life totals a little bit. But the board is is favoring me, and I can like play all of my stuff for free. That eighth of wild not great though. So I won't play that one. I'll hold that. And my opponent can make the same attack as they did last turn, but then they're like down to their last real creature. Opponent should have ported. Well, no, maybe they, they shouldn't have ported me because Brightling. Brightling changes a lot about the deck. need stuff when I have all these planes. Let's do a pump fake, see if anything happens. Nothing happened. Give me a duder. Is this comic? Uh, I'll keep these bonus ones to just gain life with sort of War and Peace with. Aether Vial, strong magic card. Gaining me hypothetical life points all over the place. <laughs> Yay, magic, says my opponent. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, might, might draw one more vial. How I win so much. Oh, sorry. It was opponent that drew the vial. You were wrong. <laughs> this game is so funny. Okay, Flicker Wisp. That is stellar. That means I can pretty safely make an attack here. I can attack in for four. I've, I switched them in the deck list, but it doesn't take effect until the beginning of the next league. Uh, league. Yeah, so I think I just attack in with Stoneforge Mystic. That put that my opponent takes four. They go down to three. I then swords the Plowshares, their Stoneforge Mystic. That puts them up to four. They attack in with their Brightling. I flicker with out their Brightling. And then I have lethal. Or I can just continue the stare off for like one more turn. Sure, so Swords of the Brightling has the same effect. I agree. And then just flicker with the Jitte. A mom, you say? No. So... I can source the plowshares the mom. That puts them to four. Brightling can gain them five. That puts them to nine. I have three. I have six on the crackback. Or, I just Swords the Brightling right now, they bounce it, I Aether Vile, Flicker the Jitte, and then I have Lethal. Or, they let the Brightling die to go up to 6 life, but then I still have Lethal. Um, I can flicker the mom, swords the plowshares, the stoneforge mystic, that puts them to four, but then they brightling and gain five life. I'm not going to think about it too much. I'm just going to get rid of the mom. Cards are really good. Hmm. 
Another mob. Well, that's just the best of both worlds for me, actually. Uh, so so Arkin, if I if I flicker wisp I, and I and I want to equip it, I have to do it on my turn. I can't actually like flicker wisp the Stoneforge Mystic because it's pro white due to the sword. So I can't actually really flicker wisp anything for value. So like I could have made an attack, cast a flicker wisp, equipped it, uh, but the blowout potential that flicker wisp otherwise has is pretty important. And Kez, yes, uh, Brightling is absolutely awesome. I've been very, very, very happy with, uh, with it in my deck. All right. So game two win. So game two win with Sword of War and Peace. So from the other side of the table, sort of an interesting note there is that Brightling was almost as central to that game as the pieces of equipment themselves. And like, let that sink in. That's crazy. Yeah, your your last turn there worked very, very into the, the flicker wisp that I had. Like I get I get how that attack like my attack meant hell you draft like a first striker, so you don't want to swing in with the stone forge necessarily, so like I I get it. But it just worked out very well for me. Yeah, yeah, the source is exploding with people who aren't testing Brightling and so they don't know the card's good. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll keep this hand. This is a reasonable DNT hand, right? Like I have two powerful two drops in my hand for different sorts of matchups. <laughs> you should have run my clock. That's that's one theory. <coughs> I'm guessing this is going to be like aggro loam. There's been a lot of that like popping up uh, in online deck lists. Like it could just be lands, but I've seen a lot of loam. Not lands is indeed the answer. I'm going to play Thalia in order to sort of dampen the power of the extra cards my opponent is going to get off of their Bob. Lingering Souls? Question mark? No, it can't be Lingering Souls. Opponent has Lingering Souls, maybe. It can't cast it due to Thalia. 
or just maybe paid improperly. Ugh, five five nine already. This is fine. So I got the Mirren Crusader this turn rather than just like playing the Stoneforge because I think my path to victory is going to be like, oh man, Cabal Pit, that's really good. Uh, I think my path to victory is going to be like Mirren Crusader plus Jitte. Um, I think it's a little early to say whether or not a card like Palace Jailer actually will be good. I, like, I don't know, like, that's a card where at the right times it's really good, but you kind of need a, a good feel for the field to see whether or not it's going to be good. And I, I just don't have large sample sizes yet. And, like, we only really have, like, one good set of like data dumps, we have the the challenge results from this weekend, that's about it. Yeah, Monarch is a really cool mechanic. I, I really enjoy that mechanic a lot. Okay. So my Thalia is off the table. That's neat. Okay. So my opponent doesn't have Threshold for this Cabal Pit yet, but this Cabal Pit can answer Mirren Crusader. So now what? I wish I ripped a land so that I could go like land put on recruiter attack in, because like now Bob plus lib library is gonna be super obnoxious. And my opponent can very likely get Threshold to turn on this Cabal Pit soon. So I'd like to keep this Marin Crusader for after Cabal Pit is gone. In order for that to happen, I probably need... Threaten something annoying. And I guess that's Stoneforge for Batter Skull. It's not even certain that my opponent, like, can Cabal Pit and... get Threshold in the same turn right now. Alright, there's another Bob. So, like, what what happens if I, if I play the Brightling? Like, I, I can't use my mana and just like dump it into the Brightling right now, and it's not going to be bigger than the Knight right now. So, this is not the optimal time to play Brightling. This is one of the first instances where I've drawn a Brightling, and I would rather it be like uh, a Mirror Crusader. Uh, Sir Sethers, the list is immediately below the stream. And I have two of the clerics in my deck, in the main deck. Sarah Avenger is still a card that is 100% in consideration for the deck. It's not, like, invalidated or anything like that, but the flex slots are getting very tight. 
and there are starting to seem like fewer and fewer of them. Oh, that's not good. Ball pit the stone forge. I was really hoping my opponent was just like a junk Maverick deck, but now that they're punishing Maverick, that's scary. I mean, I have to accept this. It just feels bad, because I'd rather gain 10 life with it. But I can't let them keep, like, bobbing and librarying. Well, what's my strategy to beat this deck? I kind of figure it out as I go along. Uh, this is... This is the sort of matchup where... Your play skill matters a lot, and tight sequencing is rewarded. How bad this matchup is is a function directly of how crazy the sideboard cards are. Like when my opponent goes and plays like infinite planeswalkers or something like that, I will have a lot of trouble. But if they're just running some normal stuff, it's, it's fine. It's a fair fight. Uh, Sir Sethers, I'm frequently bringing in the third Brightling. It's it's a good filler card. Shit. I'm pretty comfortable conceding here. We're gonna call that one a loss to double Bob. Just the, the card advantage from it was pretty crippling. Alright, I want a pro red sword for punishing fire. Alright, I'm gonna bring in the pile of maybe cards. And we're gonna figure out what we're actually gonna do. This is a really hard matchup to sideboard for. So let's start with the 100 percenters. I 100% want rest in peace. I 100% want the council's judgments, the sword of war and peace, and the recruiter of the guard. These cards are 100% coming in. These are the questionable cards that I can consider. I usually board Thalia's out in this matchup. It's an acceptable effect, but it's not something that is critical to winning in any capacity. I probably don't want to play four pieces of equipment. I probably want to play three. So I'll probably cut the Sword of Fire and Ice. Um, I 100% want one Mirror and Crusader in the deck, but I don't know how many more I want beyond that. I don't think it's any more than one right now, until we see where the metagame's at, but I want it as a tutor target. It's just a great offensive and defensive card, and a great generic equip equipment handler. So I think I'm planning on ha trying to like obtain aerial dominance this game rather than dominance on the ground. These clerics are kind of throwing off my normal sideboarding because normally I have some other stuff that I can just trim. But the clerics are kind of important because they can shrink the knights down to reasonable sizes. 
Maybe I'm supposed to keep the Brightlings to help me race and just trim one Flicker Wisp. Not exactly sure. Well, I'm going to keep this, and I'm going to really hope that my opponent doesn't have a Chalice on one to invalidate both of these swords to Plowshares. So I'm already planning on fighting the Graveyard Recursion cards that I care about via Rest in Peace and the Cleric. So I don't know that the Prelate is awesome. Well, that's pretty stellar. Right, I don't I don't really care about one abrupt decay, right? Like an abrupt decay hitting my stuff or something like that. That's that's not the end of the world. Like, my, my question is, like, is Prelate better than some of the random stuff that's left in my deck? Like, is Prelate going to be better than, say, a Mom? Is Prelate going to be better than one of my other Flicker Wisps? Okay. I mean, I don't, I don't play this matchup regularly, so I, I, like, I can't say that I have infinite matchup knowledge or anything, but if I'm thinking about how I'm winning the game, Prelate isn't in the I'm winning the game picture, it's in the I'm not losing the game picture. What do I have at two? I have another Revoker, Stoneforge's Cleric, so I have more at three than two, but I can probably afford to wait a turn.
So I'll, I'll pull up the sideboard if if we after this one and like we we can talk about the sideboarding some more. But like, there's a very real question of like, what would we take out if I pull a like if I want the pre light in. I'm not sure what exactly that meant, but I don't like it. I kind of feel like my opponent has a zealous persecution since they like fetched their mana that way last turn and then decided to sandbag it for a little while. So accordingly, I'm just going to get a Stoneforge Mystic, something that won't die to that. Keeping Punishing Fire in mind, I'm going to get Sword of War in peace. Ah, yes, White Faces, that's a good point. We didn't consider the My Opponent Might Be Bad aspect of that, and they fetched to try to decay, thinking they could use their mocks, and then they couldn't. Oh, that's awesome. Alright, yeah, Gol Golgari Charms Fair. Days of Ith is slightly annoying. Alright, so... Bonin is thinking...
But I'm still thinking. We're not equipping Sword of War and Peace right now because I don't want to like blow the Flicker Wisp on the Maze of Ith currently. Yeah, I'm fine with I'm fine with this trade. I'm not gonna gonna tap something. That's all fine. Virtues ruin one time dealer. My opponent's pretty stuck on mana. So 3, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Okay, yeah. That just makes it easier. So you look at that and you tell me what you want to pull out for that prelate. So we want that one with the roker on the box. Like, do I just trim one mom or a prelate? No, I definitely want Recruiter, because the, the games go really long, and like finding my Crusaders and my Revokers and my Stone Forgers can be super important. Like, if anything, I can see this. So I'm going to do that. League is going fine. It's, it's nothing special, though. Uh, this hand's much better, this hand's very strong, now incredibly strong. Uh, scrying that vial to the top is just insane. <laughs> I would take out almost any card. Okay. Thank god my opponent doesn't have like a light from the loam. I would just like shudder at how powerful that was. The K of Isle. Well, that's a thing. Um I don't think I want to play rest in peace yet. Or maybe I do. Maybe I just want to like slam the rest in peace because if I do so, then if my opponent has punishing fire. Yeah. I'll just slam this.
I don't, I don't, I don't just want to like play Stone Forge. My opponent uses these two to like punish and fire Stone Forge and rebuy it immediately. This just gives me so much greater flexibility in in what I'm doing. Okay, do I want a wasteland? I don't really know that I do. I'm not taking my opponent off of like any real spells. They have double mox diamond. I can probably use my mana better than them, and I can like put in batter skull and port on my next turn. So if you say I'd waste the grove, tell me why you would waste the grove. What what does that accomplish? I'm not saying that it's wrong. I just I just want an explanation. Yeah, I'm not really sure what's going on over there. Not gonna lie. I could have wastelanded like the Dryad Arbor there to just hit for a huge chunk, but I feel pretty confident that removing two of my opponent's lands that turn is just disgusting. Toxic Deluge for six. I accept. Actually, I don't really care if they use a piece of removal on the stone forge. I'll just port them. I want to. I want to do that in one turn when I get to five mana. So I can just start hitting with sword this turn. So I can port this, hit for three, four, five. But I think I'm just going to set up to remove the bob on the following turn.
Yeah, I, I do. I do wish I had the fifth land. I didn't consider like fifth land's ability to do recruiter and provoker in one turn. Like I was just considering white as my choke point. Lily last step. Okay. Now I can equip stone forge. Yeah. Out of sort of sort of war and peace read now. Damage to that player, so I can't hit planeswalkers with it anymore. This essentially attacks for three at them. That's fine. Thumb doesn't really know it, but that's probably just good, actively good for me. That's a scavenging ooze. Sure, you shrink that. Let's get that ooze out of there. It doesn't do a lot, but it blocks. So I can port this and then do nothing else with my turn. So I'll probably just Recruiter for Revoker this turn, I guess. Or I can just keep going for the life total. Like, the Lily's not that scary. No, I can take a turn off from attacking to play Flicker Wisp and Blink Batter Skull. Then I have two big bodies. Yeah, let's do that. Like, the Lily can kill the Flicker Wisp. But then I have a batter skull. And then I hit for four, five, six, seven, eight next turn. You like just attacking? I'm only hitting for three. It's it's better, like mathematically, it's just better to take a turn off so that I can hit for seven next turn. Or maybe six. And then, like, moving this equipment to the batter skull later on is just going to be awesome. All right, so if I pump with... Oh, sorry, pump with Jitte. So I can hit for three, four this turn. That puts him to seven. Then I get two counters on Jitte. That's one, two, four, five. Eh. I can also just, like, Recruiter for a Revoker. And, like, Revoker on Lily or Revoker on Mox Diamond is going to be insane.
I mean, yeah, most certainly the, be the best draw in my deck is going to be just a land. No, but like I could hypothetically like play Revoker or Luke Sword War piece to it and prevent that sort of thing. Neat. My recruiter gets to live. Actually, Wasteland would be just a great draw, too, just to like, get that Maze Myth completely off the table. Alright. My opponent scoops it up there. I think the rest of my staff members have filtered back in, so I probably have the end of the day staff meeting coming up. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and call it here. Uh, I will be back tomorrow morning. Tomorrow's a Greek day, uh, so at approximately 9 or 9.15 uh, a.m. Eastern Time, I'll be back and streaming with some more Breitling. Um, normally I'd talk a little bit more, but uh, my other staff members are here, so i got to go. So cheers and have a good night, everyone.